through here. What the gameplay needs to do is immerse you in the world, give you as many interesting actions to survive in this world and overcome obstacles. And obstacles could be infected, it could be other people, it could just be the environment, it could be rushing water, anything that could happen in this post-apocalyptic world. Are you clean? Yeah. But more than anything, it needs to put you in Ellie's shoes, that you're experiencing what Ellie's experiencing, making you feel what she feels. Because the more we do that, the more the emotional beats of the story work for us, and the more they work for us in this very unique way that only works in video games. The gameplay philosophy of The Last of Us Part II is putting you in the shoes of Ellie and everything that that means. It means giving you a threat constantly, as this world has. It means giving you the hard choices. Because this game takes place in such a hostile universe and our characters are pushed to do really difficult things, we want to put you in alignment with those choices. We want you to understand how hard certain decisions were for these characters, because they're hard for you. I would say the overarching philosophy of how we approached designing the game mechanically is how can we take things to the next, next level. Everything kind of comes out of the story. And how do we do it through systems? So one is you have to feel the pressure of survival survive by the skin of my teeth? How do I use all these, all the scrap around me? Any kind of bullet, any kind of rag, any kind of bottle of alcohol. How do we give you that sense of being a survivor in this world? <laughs> Ellie is very small compared to Joel and more nimble. How do we make you feel like you're not the strongest person in the room, but you still should be able to rise to the challenge and survive, you know, a fight with a bunch of people that are all bigger than you? So therefore it meant creating a character and systems and mechanics that allow you to be much more nimble. And that's where we added um, a jump button. In the first game we had a clamor button, but not really jumping. And here, Ellie can jump. The combat scenarios are much more vertical, where Ellie can use elevation to her advantage. Prone is a huge, huge one. Prone, obviously, it means to lay flat on the ground. Uh, something so simple, again, something that in real life you'd be able to do. Letting the player have access to all their weapons, all the items, crafting, everything, while in that position, and it just creates so many more emergent uh, things in gameplay. Now that we have this other state that the player could be in, which are very low to the ground, how else can we use this other than just hiding in vegetation? We're like, well, there's a lot of man-made things or different structures that have collapsed that allow just enough space for you to crawl under, which means that now, as enemies are looking for you, you can crawl under things and hide, and it's just one more way to assess your environment and use it to Ellie's advantage. Now, because you can hide under things, we gave the enemies, we made them smarter and gave them the ability to look under things. So while you might hide somewhere and be safe for a while, eventually they're going to start looking under stuff. And if you're hiding under a truck and they spot you, they're going to yank you out and then try to kill you. Dodging is a big one because now with dodge, Anytime you're in a you're in a a scuffle, you have a chance to get away. You have a chance to counterattack. It lets escape be an option as well. Sometimes you just gotta run. And that is another part of this world, which is sometimes the threat is so overpowering that you just have to get away. When you are partially hidden or you're like you're in grass, that means people from afar can't see you, but people from closer can kinda see you they will eventually acquire you. You're not completely hidden when you're in grass. She went into the grass. Watch yourself. And it makes you as a player become much more aware of your surroundings. Jump, prone, dodge, you know, all these things feed into both exploration and 
uh, combat because it lets us expand the space. If the size of spaces can be bigger, the intricacy of spaces can be more complex, and it still works exactly as you would expect. So when it came to our level design, we really wanted to challenge ourselves to make a world that really felt like a real space as much as we possibly could and didn't feel like a series of combat encounters and exploration spaces and then combat encounters that felt like a, a hall of horrors or something, um, but something that really felt like a space that you could explore that seemed like a legitimate uh, urban environment. And that pushed us to make our level design uh, even more open than it was in the first game, which for us at the time was, uh, was pretty open. In this game, we've gone so far in making the level design open uh, that there are actually entire story moments, entire combat encounters, like full scripted sequences that you may completely miss. And there are things that we feel like, even though a portion of our player base may never see these things, uh, the fact that when you do encounter them, you feel like you discovered them, it lends them this charm and this magic that I think is unique to games that, you know, this, this happened to me because of what I did and what the place I explored to. Crafting is very much about a payoff to exploration, meaning that when you enter new spaces, you want to look around for supplies. You want to open drawers and cabinets um, and look for different things that will allow you to craft either items that can help you heal, items that can help you attack multiple enemies at once, such as the Molotov um, or the landmine that Ellie can craft. Items that can help augment your weapons, like the silencer for her pistol, um, or craft new kinds of ammo. It also gives us tons of interesting gameplay choices and overlaps that you can do in any moment in, in on the fly. We try to be a game that wants you to make a lot of different decisions in combat as possible. And the way that we've expanded the recipe roster and all of the recipes and how they interact with each other is carefully chosen for the different ingredients and making sure that you always have these interesting decisions to make. We put a much stronger emphasis on the importance of the choices you make in the long term for your character. Would be useful. Through the weapon upgrade system, through the player upgrade system, there aren't enough resources in a single playthrough to fully upgrade your character. The choices that you make, you're going to have to live with. And we wanted to make sure that all of the choices that you made had a really noticeable and tangible effect on the way that you play. You feel a greater kinship with Ellie because you are living with decisions that you've already made. Like you, you are continuing this through line of her journey through this world. Uh, and the moment to moment gameplay is influenced by that in a way that we haven't before. The realization that your choices have these long term consequences is very much like the nature of the, the narrative of the game. Uh, and I'm happy that the mechanics are supporting that. So one of the things that makes Naughty Dog special is our insane attention to detail. And that comes from just extreme amount of research. So whether it's researching a theme, let's say this, this idea of retribution or justice, like we would read a ton of books and look at movies and even watch like interviews and news programs about stuff that's going on in the world and then discuss it among ourselves, like what's happening here? What can we draw from this? How can we base these fictional characters on reality to make them feel more authentic? Our hope with this game is to create the most authentic characters that you've seen in a game. Not just Ellie, not just Joel, but that every character you see is dimensional. Obviously, in telling a character-driven story, you have to create characters. And it starts with a story concept that then can develop into level ideas and more specific narrative beats. Once we kind of have a good understanding of the narrative that we're after, we could start writing scripts. 
And that's really the first time the characters come to life and they're speaking, even though it's just words on the page. Now they're becoming more specific. And the next step after that is to either bring in the existing cast from the first game, such as Ashley Johnson, who played Ellie, and Troy Baker, who played Joel, or casting new characters. And they're interpreting the material and bringing their knowledge of these characters and their take on these characters to life. I think authenticity from every department has been kind of a, a goal or a focus, whether or not that's in the animations and how we're mocapping or in the effects and how we're simulating you know, the different elements to get the effect look that we want in game. We wanted it to be as realistic as possible, as believable as possible, so that as you're playing, you can hopefully get fully invested in it and fully immersed. And we didn't want to have a character moment where it's unbelievable, both from a narrative and visual standpoint. Some other advances that we've had is like now we can like make veins pop on their forehead if like they're really angry, or likewise there's we can redden their skin. It could be based on emotion or it could be based on what's happening to them physically. How red their eyes can get is controllable. How tears flow off their eyes and their face is all new um, tech that we've developed for this game. Oh, hey, we got another trespasser, a girl. Did you see her? Additionally, we have this human nuance to our human enemies uh, that makes the situations that you're in so much more terrifying and emotionally affecting than they would be otherwise because at almost every turn we've gone as far as we possibly can go to make our human enemies feel as human as possible. I got something. Oh, shit. Infected. Let's get in there. You can hear the enemies calling out, looking for you, and giving you slight little uh, gameplay hints as to what they're going to do, and so you can try to plan around it. Oh, what is it? Someone took them out. We got something. I'll go see what's up. So whether that's the nuance of their awareness system of like what they should know about and when, how they convey knowledge to their friends, to the kind of emotional content of the game. So when they refer to each other by name, when they scream in anguish, when they see their friend die, <laughs> when they, they scream in anger as they're like kind of trying to hunt you down or, or attack you. <laughs> they feel real, and it makes the situation that you're in feel real in a way that you haven't seen before and, and you might not be ready for. There was a ton of research that was done into foliage and different kind of foliage that exists in different parts of the country to make those areas feel authentic. Studying local architecture of wherever we are and making sure that feels authentic. We took three trips up to Seattle we actually got photo scanned out of like natural elements in the forests and went through and walked the path of Ellie through Seattle to actually get as much reference that we could. And that was anything from going, you know, inside buildings and taking pictures of signs on the wall to various bus stops and awnings around the, the world. Like we're trying to find those kind of iconic details and bring them into the environment that once we get it into the final game, it's like, it all comes together to hopefully make something as believable as we can. Hopefully with all these things combined, it, it gives you the feeling that you're playing a Naughty Dog game. This is what we go for. I feel like these are all real people. I feel like this is a real place. I feel like this was a real situation that I was in and then I handled it in a way that makes sense if this was real life. The world of The Last of Us is dangerous. Unless you're living in a protected area, there is something lethal around every corner. Once you venture out of your home, you're in danger. And where we're taking the story and where we're taking Ellie is like each step of the way, she's putting herself in more and more danger to bring these people to justice. I would say that the world, in every sense of the word, is bigger than The Last of Us Part One both in scale and the amount of physical space that exists for you to explore, for you to encounter other people. Yeah, this route has its perks. Our hope is to make every corner a challenge, make every decision hard for Ellie. And so we do that not just in the gameplay you experience, but also in the level design. 
So part of that is making certain experiences really hostile, be it through weather or through rivers or, or craggy cliffs or slick snow. But we also use it in terms of how blind the player is. Like, what can they see? How safe do you feel? Can you see a threat coming around the corner? You never know if the bullets in your gun are going to be enough. You never know if you can stop and bandage your arm. You can never fully breathe. And we want you to be in alignment with Ellie, who can never fully breathe when she experiences this trauma. For Jackson specifically, we wanted to make it feel like a very close-knit kind of community that's focused on family, focused on sustainable ways of living. I obviously have the hydroelectric dam generator that's powering the town, so we have you know, electricity in Jackson, which is not something that maybe players would expect to see in the world. But given that we're further in time, we wanted to show that there are certain people dedicated in the world to rebuilding a life that doesn't revolve around killing people and, and scavenging. As you walk around the town, you can hear kids laughing. You could see um, people going into restaurants and eating, and it's a very kind of tranquil town. Now, we know there's all these horrible things happening outside the walls, but they've been able to protect the innocence of, of this town. Jackson, in many ways, represents what is at stake for our characters, a, a life of peace and relative comfort, uh, a life where you can fall in love, a place where children can play and it's OK. And I think you know, when we were looking at building out Jackson, it's like, okay, how many of those moments can we represent? What's awesome about the world of The Last of Us is it shows just how precious the things that we take for granted in our everyday lives, how precious those things really are. Seattle compared to Jackson is uh, very different. It's more of a war zone, I would say. Part of the interesting thing with Seattle or the Pacific Northwest is that there's all this rain and all this foliage and wildlife, and it's this very lush area that if someone were to sell down, it'd be a pretty good place to sell down just as far as the kind of fruit you can scavenge, the animals you can hunt. And then because it is so lush, because it is so um, teeming with resources, is why there are multiple factions trying to fight over those resources. <laughs> One faction you run into in Seattle is the Washington Liberation Front. When the outbreak happened, the military took some pretty drastic actions and quarantined parts of the country. And this was their way of protecting the population that has survived this horrendous outbreak. And because of that, it led to rise of these resistance groups. And in the first game, we saw the Fireflies. And we heard about other groups. And in this game, we get to see, here's another group that rose called the Washington Liberation Front that was able to defeat the army and thereby take over a lot of their equipment. And they're this very militaristic faction. And at the same time, you have the Seraphites. And they're a religious group that also came up out of the outbreak that believed that the pandemic came because of sin. They're trying to reset the world and return it to a better place than it was. In The Last of Us, almost any group that has survived this long has to be dangerous. Um, if you're not dangerous, you're not gonna survive. You're gonna become someone's victim. And the two factions you run into are both very dangerous. The WLF has a lot of military equipment that they're able to use to defend the area, and they have large numbers, whereas the Seraphites are very quiet and stealthy and able to use the large amount of foliage to their advantage and they fight more in this kind of guerrilla warfare. How you deal with them is going to be different because they have different language, they have different communication style, the scars will whistle to each other with this different language. And they have some of the stuff that you have. You have a bone arrow, they can hit you with arrows and impale you and you have to pull the arrow out. They have big sledgehammers and melee weapons. The WLF, they have trained dogs that will sniff and attack you. Dogs are a new level of threat that Ellie hasn't had to negotiate before, and hopefully they create a new complicated choice for the player. We saw in them an opportunity to, to challenge people's perceptions of what a combat setup can be. 
we wanted to find really hard choices. The dogs themselves have names. They're called out by their owners. We wanted every setup to be challenging. Oh, that smell. Looks like Infected did this. How many do you think it would take to bring down a moose? Infected are still a threat in this world. We wanted to take first our basic classes that we had in the first game and say, okay, how do we, what's different about them now? So we'll have scenarios where way more runners, like we can have hordes sometimes of runners coming after you and it might be about just escaping because the odds are just overwhelming. You know, this thing just keeps mutating. There's, there's certain evolutions of infected that you haven't seen before, certain new classes. There's the shamblers, which kind of have these exploding acid clouds. Uh, when you get near them. You're running down a hallway and you have to suddenly make a decision like, oh, do I want to take the damage and go through this cloud or find some other route or go back the way I came? And it kind of forces you to on the fly kind of make new decisions about how you're going to deal with uh, the threat behind you or potentially in front of you. So again, it's about how do we make fighting against infected intelligence. So when you come on a space, you're listening to audio cues because different classes will make different sounds. If you just go in guns blazing and throw caution in the wind, you could easily get overwhelmed and regret that strategy. That level of uncertainty and instability is something our characters have to carry with them every day as they go out into the world to protect the people they love most. And that threat is banging on their door every day. I really hope you make it. I wish things were different. Ellie! But they ain't. Please stop! I'm leaving tomorrow. To do this smart, we'd be leaving Jackson vulnerable. So they just get to get away with this? How'd you find us? You can't stop this. I want what you want. We could have killed you. <laughs> Maybe you should have. I'm Neil Druckmann, Vice President of Naughty Dog and the Director of The Last of Us Part Two. We're just a few weeks away from launch on June 19th, when the game will finally be in your hands. The wait has been long, and we're extremely grateful for your patience especially now in the midst of these unprecedented and challenging times. We hope you're all taking care of yourselves and that you, your friends, and your loved ones are doing well. Because of these extraordinary circumstances, we can't be together in this final stretch and share the experience like we usually would. So today we're trying something different, something we've never done before. Over the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to give you an in-depth look into what awaits you in The Last of Us Part Two, including new details about the gameplay experience and story. And to cap it all off, we'll be showing a never before seen lengthy gameplay sequence. You'll definitely want to stick around for that. I don't know what happened. 
I was supposed to take her to the fireflies and walk away. They were actually going to make a cure. The only catch. It would kill her. The Last of Us Part Two picks up Ellie and Joel's story several years after the events of the first game. Ellie and Joel have settled in Jackson, Wyoming, amongst a thriving community of survivors. With the threats of the world kept outside the town's walls, Jackson has been able to find relative peace and even stability. Ellie is now 19, lives on her own, and has been able to forge lasting relationships within the community. Scale of one to 10, how would you rate our kiss from last night? However, this peace is short-lived. Jackson and Ellie suffer a violent and traumatizing event. Ellie sets off back into the treacherous outside world in search of retribution and justice. Her journey will take her to new parts of the country previously unexplored in The Last of Us. The story spans multiple seasons and climates, from the snow-capped mountains of Jackson to the lush Pacific Northwest. Each introduces a wide range of exterior and interior environments for you to navigate and explore, rendered in meticulous detail and unprecedented scale with the latest iteration of the Naughty Dog engine. Our goal was to make these environments not only beautiful, but feel as grounded and authentic to the cities they're based on as possible. Much of the story unfolds in what remains of Seattle, a massive former quarantine zone. Its locales are incredibly diverse, spanning a dense city center with a skyline of towering high-rises to the beautiful suburbs and stormy waterfronts that surround it. The city exhibits drastic shifts in architecture, elevation, and weather. And with part two, we've introduced new traversal mechanics that afford greater exploration and ways to navigate threats. Ellie is not only able to climb and jump over gaps, but she can use ropes to scale vertical terrain or swing over obstacles, allowing you to discover new areas, resources, and side narratives. These more open environments also create new strategic considerations in combat, whether it's to get the jump on enemies or bypass them entirely. The Last of Us Part Two features some of the largest environments we've ever created. Horseback riding will allow Ellie to quickly cover some of these expansive terrains. Some streets are so flooded that a boat is required to navigate them. However, the world of The Last of Us is as lush and inviting as it is deadly. As Ellie uncovers the path to finding those who have wronged her, she must face the many threats of this unknown city. In the wake of the pandemic and the fall of the quarantine zone, Seattle has become a war zone where two warring factions find themselves in an ongoing conflict for territory and resources. One of these groups is the Washington Liberation Front, otherwise known as the WLF. The WLF are a militia group that began as resistance to the military occupation of Seattle and eventually wrestled control of the city from them. They are highly trained, organized, and well-equipped with weapons they stole from the army. They occupy much of the city imprisoning or killing trespassers on site. Hey, we got another trespasser, a girl. Did you see her? <laughs> on the other side of this bloody conflict is a group of religious zealots called the Seraphites, or Scars, defined by the self-inflicted deep cuts that they bear across their faces. Like the WLF, they're deeply tribalistic and territorial. They're known for being stealthy, using overgrowth as cover, and they use more silent weapons like bows and arrows. Clip her wings. <laughs> but beyond this conflict among survivors, the threat that originally brought the world to its knees is very much present. Every human is in danger of falling victim to the infected. They are the recently infected runners who are more numerous and aggressive in this game. The blind but extremely deadly clickers, 
and the stalkers, who sneak and hide until they're ready to attack, surprising their victims with extreme agility and brutal violence. The Last of Us Part II introduces new stages of infected, such as the Shamblers. Large, heavily armored enemies that are covered in pustules. Upon getting close to you, they expel a corrosive spore cloud that burns its victims. But our most terrifying and lethal new forms of infected will have to wait until you play the game for yourselves. Overcoming these threats will require careful consideration of how you approach every combat encounter and how you leverage Ellie's unique skills, equipment, and the environment to your advantage. The WLF patrol the streets of Seattle with guard dogs, which are capable of detecting and following you even while in cover. They can pick up your scent and alert their handlers to your presence. Listen mode will reveal your scent trail, so keep moving and cause distractions to avoid detection. 25 years after the pandemic began, the world is completely overgrown. Use tall grass to hide from enemies and go prone to stay out of sight. However, this form of analog stealth means you're never fully hidden. If enemies get close enough, they can discover you, even in grass. When Ellie is overwhelmed, running away is a viable option. You can also break class or crawl through tight spaces to find new paths or areas to evade or take on your enemies. In any given combat situation, you can flee an encounter and re-establish stealth to regain the advantage. If you absolutely have to fight your way out, there are a variety of tools at your disposal. Ellie's more agile than most of her enemies. She can sprint and quickly dodge incoming attacks. Learning how opponents attack with different weapons and mastering the timing of your dodges will prevent you from taking damage and create opportunities to counterattack. You can use throwable items or well-placed shots to stun enemies before dealing a killing blow. Or using them as a shield to protect yourself or buy some time to figure out your next move. Ellie isn't always alone on her journey. Allies will take part in helping you navigate the environments, spot enemies, and meaningfully help you in combat encounters. Back off! Between the human survivors and the roaming infected, there will be times where multiple threats are present, creating new strategic considerations and opportunities. You can choose whether to attack these opponents separately and directly, or find ways to pit them against each other. Flee as they fight, or wait until their numbers have thinned out and engage with whomever's left. Our goal is to create unparalleled tension, coupled with deep systems that give you greater control and influence over your journey. As you play, you'll be able to invest in a broad collection of crafting items, weapon, and player upgrades through training manuals scattered throughout the environment and scavenging for ingredients. These skills and upgrade manuals cater to a variety of play styles, and the choices you make will create your own distinct experience. We also wanted to extend that agency and personalization to your weapons through our new workbench system. Scavenge for parts to modify and improve your weapon's performance and attributes, all of which are visualized and become part of your character. Survival will also require using the parts and ingredients that you'll find in the environment, which can be crafted into a wide range of defensive and offensive items, like proximity mines, explosive arrows, pistol suppressors, and more.
All of these gameplay systems are meant to immerse you in the world and make you feel in lockstep with Ellie's emotional journey. As we've said before, this is Naughty Dog's largest, most ambitious game. It may seem like we covered a lot, but we've only scratched the surface of what it's like to play The Last of Us Part Two. We can't wait for you to experience it all for yourself on June 19th. Until then, here's an extended sequence of never-before-seen gameplay. Enjoy. Don't make a fucking sound. Hands up. Is he? Is he? Do you know a girl named Nora? Sure, yeah. Where is she? In the hospital. Where in the hospital? Yeah, they're, they're clearing out the upper floors. She's somewhere in there. Hey, we get the job done. I bet you do. Oh, this is not fair. I'm telling you, man. Data soldier. It makes these shifts so much easier. <laughs> sure. I'll keep that in mind. Fuck. Sounds like scars are getting closer. Hope that's our guys executing those freaks. Hey, did you hear about we're all getting called up to the fob? I heard that Isaac wants us to retake all of downtown. I heard we might take the fight to them. Oh, no way. Not after what went down last time. Even Isaac isn't that crazy. That's what I heard.
I'll go check it out. I got you covered. Holy shit! You, Nora? Maybe if you pull some more garbage, Abby herself. the fuck was Abby here? I'm not stupid. You're gonna tell us where she went. When Isaac talks to us about this... I'm getting tired of this. Nora. Nora! I'm not going down for her, man. Don't scream. Put that shit down. You remember me? Yeah. You remember me. 